Hi everyone. Um, so I'm mostly going to follow a uh, paper that was uh, published a couple of years ago in the um, British Journal of uh, Mathematical and Statistical Psychology. Uh, and it's a paper that was written by uh, Andrew Gelman and uh, uh, Cosma Troila Shalizi. And it's called Philosophy and the Practice of Bayesian Statistics. Um, and the reason I ran into this paper is because when I first started working at Metrum, and uh, I wrote to one of my TA uh, back at Yale, and I told him, uh, hey, I'm doing Bayesian statistics now, uh, to which he replied, I'm relieved to learn that uh, you've switched from doing Fisherian statistics to doing Bayesian statistics. Um, which to me was an odd comment, uh, and I started wondering, well, why do Fisherian and Bayesian statisticians hate each other so much? Um, and I understand that it's more historical than uh, contemporary, and, and things have changed a lot. Uh, but in my pursuit to understand this, uh, I run uh, across a couple of different papers and books uh, that I would like to share uh, today. In particular, uh, I want to pinpoint some potential malpractices of Bayesian analysis and what uh, seems to be a, a very efficient and scientifically rigorous way of doing Bayesian analysis. <clears throat> Um, as an introduction, uh, I've picked uh, two quotes uh, from uh, two authors uh, I really, really like. And, and the first one is uh, Nate Silver, who wrote a book called The Signal and the Noise. Um, and there are going to be a bunch of quotes during the presentation, so maybe we could cast some people to read the quotes if everybody's good with the idea. Does anyone want to be Nate Silver for the presentation? Sure, I can be Nate Silver. All right, awesome. And, and who wants to be uh, Gelman and, and Shelley? Well, I think Jim should be a Gelman and Shelley because <laughs> he said, and I quote, <laughs> everybody thinks uh, Gelman is a big deal, but I can tell you the same thing uh, when I showed him the paper. <laughs> so he will be telling us the same thing. Um, so, so why don't we have a quick read of, of Nate Silver's quote. Sure. So, numbers have no way of speaking. Sorry. Numbers have no way of speaking for themselves. Okay. Numbers have no way of speaking for themselves. Data-driven predictions can succeed and they can fail. It is when we deny our role in the process that the odds of failure rise. Just to clarify, there was one. <laughs> I identified one point of confluence between Gelman's thinking and my own. So on that was specific point, it doesn't matter if you're listening to me or Gelman. But anyway, uh, we fear that a philosophy of Bayesian statistics as subjective, inductive inference can encourage a complacency about picking or averaging over existing models rather than trying to falsify and go further. Uh, so we'll keep that in mind. Um, and the first thing I want to do, is, so this is a book uh, called The Signal and the Noise that was recommended by that same TA. Uh, I'm showing you the cover picture because I really like it. I think it's a great cover picture, uh, art and science of prediction. Um, and then opening a quick parenthesis, uh, this is a book on error analysis, which I also think has a great uh, cover. Uh, it was written by a uh, tailor who I think is a physicist. And oddly enough, he dedicated this book to his wife. <laughs> and uh, this is a book called C++ Primer, where to me, the cover makes no sense at all. Uh, yeah. So, <clears throat> for the art course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so as a starting point, um, I'm going to take an example from the signal and the noise uh, of a place where uh, Bayesian analysis can prove very powerful, and that's uh, the case of when we're dealing with uh, tests that return positive or negative results, and he calls it the problem of false positives. And essentially what he's looking at is uh, young patients that are in their 40s, and they've had a, a positive mammogram, and the question he's asking is, 
what is the probability that they actually have uh, breast cancer. <clears throat> and essentially, um, the, the data we start with is that um, if a woman does not have a cancer, then a mammogram will incorrectly claim she does 10% of the time. So that's the probability of getting a false positive. Uh, false uh, positive. Um, on the other hand, if a woman does have cancer, then the mammogram will detect it 75% of the time. Uh, and as he says, Nate Silver. That's you, Rob. When you, when you see those statistics, a positive mammogram seems like very bad news indeed. And I do hope right. I remember to cite Gerd Gigerenzer, who is the originator of this, uh, of this question from, the, I think, the 1970s and early 1980s. Um, yeah, okay, right. So, um, he, yeah, it's, uh, I should have looked at the reference because it's very likely that he's referencing uh, another paper. Um, so how can, we, how can we deal with uh, this problem uh, using Bayesian analysis? Uh, essentially, we're going to assign uh, an event A, the patient has breast cancer, and an event B, uh, the patient has a positive mammogram. And what we're going to want to compute <coughs> in Bayes' rule is the probability that uh, the probability of A given B. And uh, maybe you are familiar with this equation, uh, but if we're able to, you know, uh, get some um, some data, we should be able to compute this probability. And what's actually interesting is. Um, one way of proceeding is we could imagine, let's say we have a sample of uh, patients who have been uh, diagnostic, uh, diagnosed with uh, breast cancer, then uh, we try to see how many of them actually do have uh, breast cancer. That would be one way of proceeding, but if we do not have that kind of data, uh, could, we, could, we st uh, could we still capture this information? And essentially, uh, if we use uh, Bayes' rule, what we're going to do is uh, if, we, if we know uh, what percentage of patients typically have uh, breast cancer, uh, if we know the probability of getting a positive mammogram given that a patient has breast cancer, uh, and then a couple of other uh, variables uh, where A bar stands for the opposite of event A, we can actually compute this probability. Uh, and looking at a couple of numbers, we see, you know, we have uh, the first two numbers, which we already discussed, and then we have that the probability that a patient has breast cancer is 1.4%, uh, which automatically gives us the probability of a bar. And what we find out is the probability that a patient has uh, breast cancer, given a positive mammogram, is actually 10%. And if we were only looking at the top two probabilities, this may have not been a result that we could have guessed. Uh, and you know, running a running a simulation <clears throat> where uh, the gray areas are uh, the positive uh, statistical test, and if they have a plus inside of them, then that means it's a true positive. Uh, we can see that most of the gray areas uh, actually don't contain a plus, and that's because typically a patient who's in their 40s is not going to have uh, breast cancer. So the odds that you belong to uh, that population of people not having uh, breast cancer is so much bigger than the odds of belonging to the population of having breast cancer that um, the chances of being a false positive are actually quite high. Um, and what has been great is that using Bayesian analysis, we've been able to incorporate uh, not just data, you know, that we may have not had about uh, the percentage of patients uh, who uh, had a positive mammogram but then turned out not to have breast cancer. We were able to use other kind of information such as, well, what is the percentage of uh, people who have breast cancer uh, and include that information in a quantitative manner in our analysis. <clears throat> and um, why is this a big deal? 
Well, uh, as uh, Nate Silver says, right, because okay, breast have... cancer is so rare in young women, the fact of a positive mammogram is not that telling. Usually, however, we focus on the newest or most immediately available information, and the bigger picture is lost. Right. So that then leads us to uh, Bayesian confirmation theory, which is where I think uh, things start to go a little wrong. So we've seen that we have this tool, which is Bayes' theorem, uh, that where we can, you know, sort of look at the big picture, incorporate information in a quantitative manner to derive uh, results uh, that we may not derive if we didn't, you know, use all the available information. Uh, and then I think one mistake that is very tempting is to say we're done with our analysis now. So we've computed a base equation, and we now know that in 90% uh, of the cases, a positive mammogram uh, is not accurate. And so what we've done here basically is we've drawn a conclusion based on the prior. Uh, and in a way, we, 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 we've claimed that the prior, uh, we've, we've based on the posterior sorry. We've claimed that the posterior uh, tells us the whole story. Uh, and then the nice thing about the posterior is that as we collect more data, we can keep computing Bayes' equation again, and the posterior will evolve as we collect more data. And so, uh, in uh, Gelman and Chalisi's paper, uh, the way they describe it is uh, you're going to have a model that's going to have a certain probability of being true, which, mind you, is one way of interpreting the posterior uh, distribution. And then as we're going to collect the data, uh, you know, maybe we're going to realize that actually model one is not that accurate and model two is uh, a better representation of this new data that we've acquired. And it may change with time, and then maybe model three will be better. And the idea is that the posterior tells us the probability that a model is true. And as we collect more data, the posterior is evolving, and so is our um, understanding of uh, what we are studying. So the idea of Bayesian, conf Bayesian confirmation theory is that um, we are learning as we collect more data, and the posterior uh, is a very exact description of what our state of knowledge is. And, you know, uh, one thing based on this philosophy that uh, we would want to do is, well, you know, since we can, can compare the posterior of different models, in that case, um, we are then able to uh, pick between different models simply by choosing which model has the highest posterior. Uh, and, you know, we're comforted with the idea that as we'll collect more data, it'll be very easy to include that new information. But then, you know, one thing that has been extensively criticized is that in our calculation of the posterior, we're not just relying on the data, we're relying on a prior. And in a way, the prior is, uh, you know, what I've called uh, information about what the bigger picture may be. Uh, and in the case of uh, breast cancer, you know, uh, it seems like a fairly good prior, but in many cases, you know, we may be more skeptical. Rob? Frequentists, yeah. Frequentists took issue with the notion of Bayesian prior. It all seemed too subjective. We have to stipulate in advance how likely we think something is before embarking on an experiment about it. And to me, this quote basically illustrates uh, one of the most fervent criticism of Bayesian analysis. Relying on a prior and instead of solely relying on experimental data. Um, now, there are good ways of constructing a prior, and I think that, uh, you know, in the example of breast cancer, you, we could say that. In a way, our prior is not simply um, 
some assumption we're making, uh, rather it's uh, some data that has been collected in another context and that we are adding to the model. And this can be a good example of, you know, what might be a good prior. Um, and so, uh, but in many cases, we may think that, well, maybe the prior is not that good. Maybe, uh, you know, uh, the study we used to uh, measure that uh, only 1.4% um, of the population has breast cancer uh, was biased. Maybe we're targeting a population that's not representative uh, of uh, the patients we are now dealing with. And that would be an example of uh, a misleading prior. Uh, and so one way of solving this issue was a, a branch of Bayesian analysis called objective Bayesianism, where the idea was, well, we are going to use a prior because that's part of the equation, but we're going to use a prior that's objective. And so uh, Efron uh, wrote in a paper, uh, who wants to be uh, Efron? He's the one who came up with uh, The whole of Bayesianism is to produce prior distributions that capture the idea of objectivity. Yeah. Uh, and he wrote that in a um, really cool paper from the, from the 80s, uh, before I was born, called uh, Why Not Everyone Is Bayesian. Uh, and and the paper also looking at the comments that were made about it. Uh, there are a lot of uh, criticisms. Uh, in terms of the of Efron's paper, it's not that relevant to the expose, but it's a really, it's, it's astonishing to me that somebody would write this in a scientific paper. Uh, in short, Ef Efron's article is an attack on a parody of a serious argument because it is a parody, uh, it is easily abused. Perhaps the author has been falling over all those bootstraps lying around. Um, but, you know, what, what do we mean by an objective prior? Um, in a way, an objective prior is a prior that, you know, maybe is going to be uninformed in the sense that it's not going to be biased towards certain models, but rather it's going to account for all the possible models, all the possible answers there are, that are uh, out there. And so a simple example would be, let's say we are trying to determine the median of a certain distribution, then uh, our prior could be uh, to say, well, uh, that value is, could be any real number uh, situated between minus infinity and plus infinity. And that's an example of uh, including every possible outcome. And if we are indeed able to include every possible outcome, then maybe uh, we can expect that uh, by comparing the posterior of the, different, uh, of the different models that are part of this space of every possible outcome, we would indeed be able to find uh, the best answer, maybe even the right answer. But uh, one issue, and what according to Efron was the issue here, was that um, it is, for more complicated problems than just, you know, identifying a real number, it can be very tricky to find an uninformed or an improper uh, a prior that actually describes uh, all the possible models. Uh, and, you know, he gives some examples where, where it's particularly tricky. Um, but he claims that, you know, if we were to continue working in that direction, we could get to a point where, um, you know, Bayesian analysis would become the dominant form of statistical analysis. And Bayesian confirmation theory argues that, well, we don't necessarily need an objective uh, prior you know, as long as we have a well-constructed prior, then, you know, we can trust whatever logical deductions we're going to make from it. Uh, and this applies to, to having an objective prior. Uh, and I think that this is particularly useful in decision theory uh, or, uh, let's say, um, you know, when we're playing games, when we're playing poker, we have to, you know, make a decision. We're not interested about the scientific accuracy of whatever model we have. We just want to make the best decision 
Uh, however, then in that case, you know, Bayesian analysis can be great um, to find what this best decision might be. Uh, especially because we need to make a decision before we can test our hypothesis. And then, oddly enough, uh, to me, uh, some people think that, you know, this kind of reasoning is not simply limited to cases uh, where, uh, you know, we have to make a decision, uh, let's say when we're playing poker, but it also has scientific applications. And uh, Richard uh, Dowie, uh, who I understand is a, a contemporary German philosopher, uh, wrote this about string theory, which is a branch of physics where essentially, as of now, we're unable to uh, collect any empirical evidence as to whether the theory is true or not. Uh, he argues that we can have trust in the theory. We can be confident that the theory is true uh, because uh, if we look at the context and if we look at how the theory was derived, it all makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I'm not sure that he is himself uh, Bayesian, but I think this very much echoes with Bayesian confirmation theory. Uh, and indeed, um, Nelly uh, Walshover uh, picked up on, uh, on, on that comment and other comments uh, and she wrote in an article, uh, falsificationism, uh, which is the process of testing a hypothesis against data and, and trying to falsify that hypothesis by finding the data that shows that it's not right. Falsificationism is no longer the reigning philosophy of science, Popperian falsific uh, falsific uh, falsificationism. So Popper is um, one of the most eloquent uh, advocates of uh, uh, falsificationism. Popper and falsificationism has been some, uh, supplanted by Bayesian confirmation theory. Trust in a the theory often falls somewhere along a continuum, sliding up or down between zero and 100% as new information becomes available. So in a sense, we're no longer rigorously testing uh, a theory. We're no longer trying to um, prove it wrong. Rather, we're just uh, we're just, you know, concerned with, well, based on what we know, what is the best theory we have? And once we found the best theory, we just agree about it without uh, sticking to the dichotomy between, okay, what is a, really a, a true theory, what is right, what is wrong, what is true, what is false? Uh, and when reading this comment, Andrew Gellman said, that's you, Jim. No! All right. So um, this is on his website where he talks about uh, this whole article. And, um, and this is now where we get to, uh, to an alternative approach to Bayesian analysis that, uh, in my opinion, takes advantage of what Bayesian analysis has to offer in terms of its ability to look at the big picture and add information but without ignoring uh, Popperian fals uh, falsificationism. And if I were to write a book on BCT, that would be the cover. All right. <clears throat> so, um, Gellman and, and uh, Shelley he talk about something called hypothetical deductive Bayesian analysis. And I think that this sentence says it all. Bayesian analysis does not allow us to draw conclusions, rather make inferences that need to be checked. So if we think back about uh, the breast cancer example, uh, yes, we can use Bayesian analysis to make an educated guess that in 10% of the cases, uh, if somebody uh, had a positive mammogram, then they would have breast cancer indeed. But what we really want to do is once we have this guess, this hypothesis, we actually still want to check it against empirical and experimental data. Uh, um, and you know, this is just another quote. Uh, uh, yeah, this is another quote where what he explains is that um, the, the problem with uh, Bayesian confirmation theory um, is that if we're only trying to find out what is the best model amongst a, 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 a host of models we're considering, we're making the assumption that the true model uh, is one of the models we're considering. 
but it is possible that the true model isn't one of the models we're considering uh, and that maybe there are factors we are not even thinking about. Um, which is where, you know, doing the predictive check becomes important because we might find that the best model actually has nothing to do with the empirical data. So how does he propose to proceed? <clears throat> well, these are classical methods, and which I'm very happy to say uh, we are implementing at Metrum. Uh, if, if, I mean, at least if I look at uh, Bill G's R scripts, uh, does the fitted model resemble the data? Uh, can we pr make predictions, produce new data, uh, and, and will it fit the data that was not used to fit the model? And then we can also think about uh, what the model describes as noise. Is it really noise or is there actually a pattern we can identify? Um, and then what I really like about uh, Gelman and Chalice's argument is that they say the point of doing that is not to falsify the model or to prove it wrong. Yes, this is what we want to do, but really what we're interested in is when we find a mistake, how can we learn from that mistake and improve our model? Uh, and in a way, I think the best analogy uh, for this is when you're writing a computer program, that's exactly what you're doing. You're going to run tests, you're going to try, you know, you're not just going to stick to the best case scenario, the, 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 the input that is going to guarantee that your code is going to work, you're going to try and anticipate everything that could go wrong with your code, find every bug, and that's how you're going to improve your code and make it more robust. So in a sense, this is basic QA applied to Bayesian analysis. Uh, and he then reminds us of uh, what is the role of a model, and this is where it gets, I think, a bit more philosophical and somewhat abstract. Um, so I trust that everybody agrees with what we've discussed so far. Uh, and, you know, we've been talking about finding the true model, making sure the model is true and so forth. And the term true is a bit loose. And uh, what they propose in their paper is that essentially we're making a compromise between three things. One is scientific knowledge, which might be the closest thing to truth uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this figure. Uh, then there's computational tra uh, tractability. So we want to create a model that uh, we're going to be able to fit to the data. Uh, we're going to be able to run our computer program on this. And then we are also concerned about uh, mathematical uh, convenience. Um, and if I understand correctly, what this means is um, we want to be able to understand uh, the parameters used in our uh, model. And we don't want to over with parameters that, that might make the model a bit more precise, but that would overall confuse us. Because uh, in the end, you know, what matters is that we understand what we're doing. Um, and then what's interesting is uh, going back to this idea of, you know, is the model true, is the model wrong? they claim that the model is always false. Uh, what matters is, can we reason based on the model? Not whether the model is true or not. And this, can we reason based on the model, I think is beautifully encapsulated in this uh, figure uh, that tries to find a compromise between uh, these three uh, topics. And then uh, another quote, uh, which I like, about what the role of the model is, it's, it's, a, it's a story of how the data could have been generated. Uh, finally, this brings us back to the role of the prior. So the prior is, is, is what makes Bayesian analysis so powerful, and it's also what has been uh, so widely criticized. It's the outside information we're going to add to the data set we're analyzing. Analy analyzing. It's the, the, the outside evidence we're going to add to the data we're uh, fitting the model to. And uh, a big misconception, according to uh, Galman and Shalazi, was that uh, you know, the prior represents uh, our knowledge of the problem we're dealing with. Either that, or it represents uh, 
um, our subjective belief, uh, beliefs or assumptions. <clears throat> and what they say is, no, that's not what it is. Uh, the prior is a regulatory device you know, that we use so that we don't get uh, data that might not make complete nonsense. So one simple example, let's say we have a model, we're trying to determine the surface area, and one prior would be, well, it's going to be positive. Uh, you know, and that, in a way, to me, it, it's not really, that represents our state of knowledge or subjective belief, but in a way, it could be, it could be thought of as a regulatory device. Or sometimes, you know, we're running a model, and the markup chains are not converging at all, so we're going to try and put some constraints on the parameters in the hope that we're going to achieve uh, conversion. And then, in that sense, the prior can be thought of a regulatory device. But then the great thing about it is that it's OK to take a risk when we're establishing a prior, because it's a testable part of the model. You know, if we've used a prior that's not good, that doesn't make sense, well, we're, we're going to run some tests, and we're going to figure it out. So that puts us in a very comfortable position. Uh, yes. Yeah, I think I want to quibble on that a bit on the, on that slide a bit, yeah. uh, and that's the the first bullet there. I actually don't think they were stating that that's not one of the possibilities. I think okay. they I think they still accept that one basis for selecting a prior may in fact be the statistician or others' state of knowledge of, or or belief. Uh, but I think they were opening up the range of choice of priors to include uh, the use of a prior, as you say here, as some sort of a irregularity device. You know that there is a you know sort of a a wider range of um, reasonable choices for a prior, a wider range of reasons why you might choose priors than just the first bullet point. Okay, yeah, and, and that makes, I think that yeah. makes Even sense. if you think of your initial example with the, with the breast cancer, uh, in fact, the priors were chosen based upon uh, this, you know, well, somebody's state of knowledge, whether you could argue it's the statisticians or others, uh, but those priors were based on, you know, previous, you know, experimental results, which then informed that statistician's state of knowledge. Yeah, actually, if I could follow up on that. So, the something that's unique about that, not unique, but distinctive about that breast cancer problem is that every probability in that discussion had a frequentist interpretation in the sense could be interpreted as a long-run frequency. So, that type of problem is totally unobjectionable to frequentist and Bayesians because you can assign frequency interpretations to everything that's there. But I think what part of what he's maybe getting at here is that you should free yourself up further to incorporate probability distributions that don't have any frequency interpretation um, as long as they give rise to essentially predictions that are correct. Um, so, for example, you, I mean, not an example, but by analogy, you might, if you think of yourself being stuck in your backyard and there's a high fence around you and something comes over the fence every day, like a piece of trash or something, you might have different theories about where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. You can't directly collect any evidence on those, so you can't really, but you should still feel free to posit what's going on on the other side of the fence. and. You know, if you think it's coming from kids, uh, but it's coming during school hours, well, okay, you got to throw that away. But so, in other words, you free yourself up to kind of uh, bring in things that you don't have direct evidence for, and that you can't give a frequency interpretation to. That would be my way of reading this. But yeah, that makes that makes more uh, yeah. That, that makes sense to me too. Uh, 
So a regularity, it's a regularity device in the sense that, well, I'm not just going to imagine any possible thing is going on on the other side of the fence. I'm going to kind of narrow the right. space. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not going to pick one hypothesis or the other. I'm going to say, well, it's more likely that it's this, a little bit less likely that it's this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I, I can see that. So maybe in a way, uh, by picking a hypothesis, we're, that wouldn't necessarily reflect all the probability, all the possibilities we're uh, envisioning or we might know about. But maybe for the sake of testing uh, that hypothesis, we might narrow down the prior and yeah, and and see whether it uh, agrees with the data. Uh, are there any further comments or questions about uh, the role of the prior? Okay. Um, so another nuance uh, that uh, is brought uh, to Bayesian confirmation theory is a continuous model expansion, which is uh, essentially suggested as an alternative to picking between one model or the other. Uh, you know, so we, we kind of talked about, um, you know, we're looking at the posterior and we're looking for the best model. And the idea would be uh, to acknowledge that both, that when picking, when looking at two models, A and B, both models may be, uh, may have some value uh, in different uh, specific cases, and essentially we're making, uh, we're creating a larger model that includes models A and B, but um, we're uh, indicating that models A and B are uh, special cases. And the example he, he gives is, um, it's a model to predict how citizens vote, and, uh, and there are two competing models, one of the models suggests that they're going to vote to, for, the, for the candidate whose ideals are closest to theirs, and another model suggests that they're going to be biased towards the center. So they're going to, even if um, it's not the candidate that has, uh, whose ideals are closest to theirs, they're going to tend to vote for the more moderate one. Uh, and rather than picking between one model or the other, um, I think it's fair to acknowledge that uh, on a case-to-case -case basis, somebody will uh, follow one attitude and someone else will follow another attitude. And we could think of a broader model that includes both these models, but that uh, sort of uh, pinpoints uh, which special cases they each correspond to. Uh, and then we, of course, want to do this as long as we're able to uh, keep a, uh, a well-balanced uh, compromise between scientific knowledge, computational tractability, and mathematical convention. So that brings uh, me to a brief conclusion, uh, which I think that Bayesian analysis is very powerful for making inferences, uh, because it helps us keep the big picture in mind uh, and include uh, information uh, that might not be contained in the in the data set at hand, um, but that's not where we should stop. Uh, we need to show that the predictions are consistent with uh, experimental results, and this is where the whole process of falsificationism comes into play. And and and, and you know, and I do like the idea that uh, we're no longer picking between different. Uh, models or we're no longer accepting or rejecting the model, rather we're trying to learn how can we improve our models. Uh, so we don't also stop at uh, falsification, we go a step further, how can we learn, how can we make a more complete model that we're morally certain is never going to be true, but that we can reason with. Uh, that brings me to the uh, references. Uh, so, aside from the signal and the noise, uh, all the references I found from uh, uh, Andrew Gelman's website uh, on a post called Gathering of Philosophers and Physicists on the Modern Reconciliation of Bayes and Popper. Uh, 
uh, and then he points out to the different articles and to his own paper uh, where I believe he is uh, showcasing uh, a reconciliation, a modern reconciliation uh, of Bay and uh, Popper. I now yield to questions and comments. Uh, I, will, I will just make uh, one quick comment, which is that um, Gaiman and Chalisi do insist that the ideas they're presenting in this paper are not novel. Uh, they're ideas that have been discussed uh, through the decades. Uh, and I'm just presenting uh, their review, their literary review of, uh, of the subject. Uh, but obviously, there are uh, a lot of statisticians and philosophers that need to be accredited uh, uh, for this uh, modern reconciliation. Are there any questions or comments? Yeah, I'll jump in with one. Um, part of the discussion here, I think when you were talking, there was the implication that somehow model comparison uh, is it was being criticized. And I, 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 my read of it is a little bit different there. Uh, I think you'll find that Gelman is okay with model comparison, where I think he had a bigger issue was when you when that comparison is stretched to the notion of identifying which model is true and using measures that essentially assume that one of the models is true. So that's why he, you know, he was critical of things like Bayes factors and the use of various kinds of model averaging strategies. Those are based upon estimating these Bayes factors, which in a sense are an attempt to estimate the probability that a given model is true. And he thinks that that's just basically a, you know, underpinned by a, you know, by a highly questionable concept from the beginning. Uh, but the notion of actually doing model comparisons to find out not which one is true, but which one is best for a given application, uh, I think you find he's actually quite okay with that uh, in his own uh, in his own publication history. In that, what you'll see is the use instead of things like Bayes factors, you'll see things like, you know, besides just comparing models in terms of their performance with uh, posterior predictive checks on one hand and use of uh, information criteria uh, of various kinds are things which he, he does describe. I don't know if I could argue he advocates for them, but I don't think he would criticize them on the basis that he was criticizing things like Bayes factors. Uh, yeah, thank you for <laughs> pointing that out. Um, are there any other uh, comments or questions? I was just going to say, it's, it, it's um, a lot of this seems very abstract, but I think a lot of this lies at the heart of the kind of clashes that a lot of us are familiar with between statisticians and modelers from other domains where statistics I would say, unfortunately, you know, had kind of bought into the whole uh, falsification paradigm a lot, where it was, um, you know, every it was sort of disallowed to sort of propose a narrative of what might have generated the data, because well, there's no way to directly check that that narrative is is correct, mm -hmm. um, and and, and recognizing also that you, you don't want to just be spinning up narratives that are just uh, unconnected to reality, but there's a, there's a compromise here, which is that you can posit different narratives of what's going on, and then you can refine those narratives as you get more data. You right. don't have to. Right, and I think that very much in line with uh, the work at Metrim uh, is we can posit a narrative uh, that can then inform uh, what data we're going to want to collect to to test uh, this narrative, uh, as opposed to s starting with the data uh, beforehand. 
right? I mean, that's the that's the benefit of doing predictions and simulations. Uh, although, although it was interesting to see the the, uh, the, the in, in the Gelman and Shalisi paper the the sort of you know at least the the, the allowance or, or 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 at least the highlighting of the potential service to modus tollens that that this approach can can provide as well, in particular in the context of model checking. So. Great. Well, um, on that note, thank you everyone for bearing uh, with me for uh, this um, uh, a little more abstract journal club. Um, and I, this is, I think, a really, really fascinating uh, topic. And uh, I'd be more than happy to uh, discuss it more with anybody who wants to. <laughs>